everybody. Are we on? Good morning, good afternoon. I don't even know what time it is. I think it's nighttime for our friends from Korea. They came all the way here. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. So uh, I'm Mark Collier and this is Jim Curry. Uh, we worked on uh, OpenStack together at Rackspace. So we have a longer history than that yeah, though. Okay, well, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> what was the beginning? <laughs> Well, that's a dark period we don't talk about where we worked at that company in Round Rock. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mark and I worked together at Dell. You actually had two rounds at Dell, though. You know, that's just a rumor. <laughs> Unsubstantiated. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I worked at Dell in the 90s when most of y'all weren't born yet. And then uh, again in the, the 20 aughts. The 20 aughts, that's right. Yeah. And then you were at Rackspace. When, when did you join Rackspace? 2006. Okay. And then you were at Rackspace. In 2009, 2008? 2009, yep, this is a really th thrilling story. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so we know each other. Yeah, so, so Jim uh, convinced me to get in the web hosting business, which I thought was going to be a hard sell, but cloud computing seemed like a pretty cool thing, so. No, I actually, so I'll tell one story about Mark. So when Mark, oh. uh, uh, for those of you who don't know Mark really well, you should. Uh, he's uh, uh, one of the best, uh, one of the best vision guys I know, but in terms of execution and building things around partnerships and community is just world class, uh, as you can see by what's going on here with OpenStack. Um, and I think I this is going to be a roast. <laughs> well, it is a roast, but it, I'll get to that in a second. But, but uh, you know, I think you, the reason you joined Rackspace was not because you were interested in necessarily web hosting. I think at that point, we had just gotten into cloud. We launched in 2008. And I think you were one of the first guys that, like, that really lit the fire under trying to open source. Uh, what we were doing, which is, I think, why you joined. And then you became a pain in the ass to a lot of the managers at the company on that, so. Yeah, they, they are all in favor of the, the beginning. <laughs> uh, but I, you have to, we have to give props to Jason Seats, too, because oh, yeah. he, he was, so if you guys don't know Jason Seats, um, he's now uh, managing investments at Techstars mm -hmm. here in Austin, but he previously started a company called Slicehost, which is a VPS, and Jim was running uh, corporate development at Rackspace, bought, they bought Slicehost, you bought a lot of companies. We did. It's nice having someone else's checkbook, right? You just like. It, it's fun to write. Yeah. What if we just buy you guys? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so they bought Slicehost. Um, yeah. Jason Seats is super smart guy, built this company, kind of bootstrapped, and uh, you know, it, it became a big part of Rackspace's cloud and stuff. But he, he was one of the people that really, um, he put together this awesome slide, uh, slide deck. I'm I still can't get, find a copy of it, but it was basically like, Here's what would happen if we actually went all in on open source. It's like, it's gonna be scary. You know, all the stuff's gonna be hanging out there for people to see, <laughs> our dirty laundry. But like, if we do it, we can get an army of developers and do something bigger than just building it in-house, so. And then two uh, months after he gave that talk, he quit and said, good luck. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> I, yeah, I actually convinced him to quit, which was kind of weird, I guess, but he just, I don't know. He was a, he was a startup guy, that's why yeah. he's at Techstars now, and he yeah. was in this big company. And uh, he just didn't seem happy. And I was like, dude, you sold your company. You can do anything you want. Why are you, why are you coming to work every day? And then, of course, you're not supposed to convince people to quit that work for your company, I found out later. <laughs> that's, I guess that's bad etiquette. But I was like, you should be happy. Right. Now he's much happier. <laughs> he, just, he wasn't happy managing thousands of people. It just wasn't his thing. Now he's a tech stars guy. So. Yeah. Anyway. And also, just to, if any of you guys are looking for, uh, as you think about uh, funding, if you're going to do something now or in the future, uh, one of the things that, that Jason uh, is great about is, first of all, he's built and run a company before. Um, when I went to see Slicehost the first time, uh, anyone who's ever been in a web hosting or services business knows that customers um, are awesome, but they take a lot of work. And he had 25,000 customers at that point and four employees. And I went in and met with them, and they just walked away from their computers like there was no problem. And I'm like, well, is, you have calls coming in? They're like, no, we'll be fine. So he, he built a system that was just incredible for running at scale, um, and then uh, in terms of working with entrepreneurs, he's really good at um, helping them think through all the challenges from a product perspective, from a business building perspective, and he's just stellar. So um, he's a great guy for you guys to get to know. Yeah, I think another credit to him is that, uh, for being on board with this open source plan, is that effectively the root cause was Slicehost, his, his baby that we bought, couldn't really scale. It was a good VPS for small right. business, but it wasn't really gonna be like a truly scalable uh, cloud platform for Rackspace, so we realized we need to sort of start from scratch and rewrite it, and he said, well, if we're going to do that, let's do it in open source. A lot of people would be so 
you know, protective of their baby. Like, well, there's nothing, you know, my baby's not ugly. Well, that's why he was Nobody so, knows that's why he was ready to quit. He was baby. tired. He had to rewrite everything. Like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> anyway, you were telling a story about something. I don't remember now. Um, we're, well, let's talk about money. Okay. So you've always <laughs> loved money. So now you're, now you're officially just, you just do money all the time. You like just have it in the office. <laughs> no. in bags. I'd say open source. Is okay. Not so all you're not money. at Rackspace anymore. I'm not. Yeah. So, um, uh, we started, um, we started group, uh, I'll give the whole story. So, uh, Landon Napier, I don't know how many people are here familiar with Rackspace, but Landon Napier was the CEO of the company. Um, and, uh, just an amazing leader. Um, he joined Rackspace and was a million in revenue, was a CFO initially, then became the president and then, uh, uh, became the CEO shortly after that. And I think as Mark can attest, we were a company that went through, we basically had no middle stage. It, went, it was like going from being a small company to a large company. And somehow we sur not only survived it, but we really thrived in it. And a good deal of that credit goes to a lot of different people, Lou Mormon, Graham Weston. Uh, but Lanham was the CEO and was really good at, at doing that. And so when uh, he left, one of the, the things that he thought about and we spent time talking about was, you know, how do we get to help companies that are um, exiting the early, kind of figure out what to build and uh, uh, who to sell it to, kind of the early product market fit stuff, had got that figured out, but weren't really sure how to build a company. So I think there's a lot of really smart technologists in the world who are good at sitting with seed stage companies and helping evaluate uh, whether or not it's a good technology, good product, and uh, where it's going to go. I'm not one of them, and I don't think there's that many that are really good at doing that. It's very hard uh, when someone knows their market and their customer way better than you do to really give good advice on that. But what we found is that once you get out of that stage, a lot of entrepreneurs, even if they've done it before, uh, need help on thinking through the challenges of scaling. So, you know, literally, um, how do you do go to market? Um, how do you think about uh, building your organization and your leadership team? How do you think about um, uh, services versus product? All these different types of activities. And uh, we, I think actually a story from OpenStack we learned is uh, having a good ecosystem helps. Um, we didn't have uh, any experience, maybe you did, but didn't have real experience in doing open source. We had great people that helped us along the way. I, I think about the guys in the Zen source, uh, Simon Crosby and uh, Gordon Mangione or uh, the Ubuntu guys. A lot of people helped us. And so we wanted to bring that kind of spirit of, as people are thinking about how to build something, can we not only be capital for them, but can we, uh, can we actually be helpful with them with our experience and get involved? Um, and one of the things we like a lot is open source. Um, and so. Uh, we have spent a lot of time looking at open source in particular uh, as an area to invest in. So, um, you know, that's kind of a, who so we are. This group of people that helps build, helps people build things, what's the name of that? Build Group. Okay, it's good branding. It wasn't mine because we, as you know, OpenStack had a lot of names before it was OpenStack and all the bad ones were mine. Oh, yeah. Well, we should, <laughs> we should talk about those names. What were some of the, the early OpenStack names? Uh, well, Sangria. Sangria. Does anyone know what Sangria is? Yeah. Well, I th we thought it was a good one, but we, had, we got nixed on that one. Cloud Commander? That was Graham's. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't a fan of that one. Um, and then actually uh, Kraken. Oh, Kraken. So we wanted to call it Kraken. That was kind of actually our code name for it. And what we wanted to do, <laughs> this is very silly, of course, but when we were going we to open source some stuff, we were going to like just throw out like USB keys and say, like, release the Kraken. I don't know. That was because that it was, was all for one joke, but that's like totally worth it, I think. <laughs> well, we missed the, you missed the chance for the K release. Oh, yeah. Well, you can come back around the next time there's a kilo. Okay. Yeah. I was like, what was the K release? Yeah. But it's, it's interesting, you know, having done, um, I've been around here talking to a lot of companies and one of the things that we found is, uh, first of all, is anyone here looking for money now, by the way, or trying to raise money? Uh, cause I could, Okay, so he wants money. I'd like some money. <laughs> Christian, give him some money. Um, so one of the things that there's a lot of hand wringing that goes on in the open source world about, um, you know, is there ever going to be a bill, how many billion dollar companies are going to be in this space? Are, aren't you supposed to call them unicorns or is that unicorns? Is that over, right? Is that fat over now? Or uh, uh, someone else calls them donkeys with uh, donkeys with party hats on. 
Um, but the open source world, there's always, it's actually, the analogy to OpenStack to me is really similar. You know, there's, uh, OpenStack, when we launched it, there was a whole lot of like, there's just a lot of doubt. You know, you're not gonna make it. There's all these challenges, but it just kept kind of going and going and found its own, own place. Open source, there's, there's a lot of uh, prognosticators who are um, having a hard time really getting through how you build a big company. Um, but what we have found is uh, there's a lot of things changed that people haven't really paid attention to. Uh, one is uh, we forget now that five years ago enterprises were not doing cloud. You know, we, Rackspace built their entire business on uh, you know, people in uh, IT departments or in marketing departments pulling out their credit card and swiping and getting someone to spin up an instance and start running. Um, and then it became more mainstream. Open source was actually the same way. Um, when we started uh, trying to sell companies on the idea of an open source cloud, that was a really hard thing for them. Enterprises really were not uh, interested in adopting open source yet. And in a very short it, period- It was not a positive, it was a negative. It was to a, a negative. Lot of people, it was like, oh, okay, well, you know, who's gonna stand behind it? And it's like, okay, you know, other than Red Hat, no one seemed to have ever heard of. <laughs> That's right. Any open source thing that they did relied on. You, That's you know, right. They probably did, but they just didn't, hadn't quite crystallized for like the people at the top of a lot of companies. That's right, and in fact, a lot of them, you know, had very antiquated views of it, right? It's not as secure, uh, we're not gonna be as much of control, the, all, all these things that have really changed in the last five years. And I think that is something that we are still in the very, very early stages of, um, and that's where the dollars start to come in. So when enterprises want to adopt technologies, they don't necessarily just want to adopt stuff that's free or stuff that they're gonna run as a one-off that doesn't look like the rest of the world. They want stuff that's standard, that they know they can hire support for from outside, and that there's vendors that are gonna support it, a la like the Red Hat example from a long time ago. It may not be in the form of a package distribution, it may be in some other form, but enterprises want that but we're still in the very early stages of it. Um, but that is one way that I don't think people think enough about, um, and there'll be a lot of opportunities there to, to create value. The second thing is, historically, people have not liked the idea of a company that gets started with uh, a services focus and then moves towards product. Um, and this is why open source companies have had trouble getting funding in the past. Um, I think it's actually, it's actually interesting uh, to think about as a negative, because in my mind it's actually a positive. Um, open source companies have a unique opportunity to take a product, i.e. the projects they work with, go work with early customers, um, start to package it up and learn what they want, and from there build their business models. And uh, for whatever reason, it's not been a popular way for VCs to fund, but we, we like uh, investing in that, looking for opportunities there. Um, so I think, again, market dynamics are changing. Um, I think people are gonna get more open to uh, open source business models being more fundable. And uh, you know, whether or not we actually end up with a lot of big open source companies or a lot of really small ones, I think there'll be a lot of money paid to them uh, by customers. Uh, and I think they're gonna continue to create value and uh, there'll be an opportunity for, for folks to do it. So I say all that because if you're thinking at all about doing an open source based business, uh, I would say go do it, you'll find there'll be more friendly investors like us to look at it, and I think it will be a great space for customer acquisition in the next few years. So can you talk at all about some of the companies you've invested in, or is it all like hush-hush? No, 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 not hush-hush. We've only done two, so it'll be a quick conversation. Um, we, one of them, um, I'll talk first about one of them that's not related to open source, this company called Maintenance Assistant. Uh, they basically have a SaaS platform for maintenance departments that have to serve uh, uh, companies that really have revenue producing assets so that go, if they go offline, they're not making money. So think factories and power plants and chemical uh, equipment, things they really need to track. Uh, ironically, uh, they use a ton of open source and if you go through all their models, it's a big part of how they empower their business like everyone else does. Um, the second one, which was actually our first investment, was a company called Continuum Analytics and they're based here in Austin. And is anyone here familiar with Anaconda Python? Anyone know that? So these guys uh, have Anaconda Python. The founders wrote NumPy, if anyone's used the NumPy software library, uh, DataPy, SciPy. Um, and it's interesting, that's the exact model we like. They're, they were consumers first. They started off, uh, the founders were scientists, uh, uh, a biologist and a physicist. Like lab coats and stuff? Lab coats, smocks? yeah. Not data scientists, scientists. Um, actual scientists? Actual scientists, right? <laughs> they still exist. And uh, they were doing research and uh, they found the tools inadequate for the work they wanted to do. They wanted to write their own scripts. They found Python to be the easiest language to learn. They learned Python. That led to the creation of these libraries. Um, and then they decided to launch a business around it. And they started as a services consulting business and have gradually moved that to a, to a product uh, opportunity. And uh, they're awesome because, um, actually something I didn't say that's 
fun about investing in open source. They have a sense of purpose that's also beyond just the company. Like they really want to change the world. They want to make data science accessible, usable, not only by data scientists, but for uh, managers who may not actually know how to use the tools today, but need access to data artifacts and the ability to manipulate them. But they believe very much in their mission. And this is another powerful thing about open source companies when you get into the right one and, and um, as you find them that they're not only about building great uh, 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 companies and, and wanting to make them succeed, but they actually usually have a mission that's beyond that. They want to they want to make it so that developers' lives can be easier, or they want to make it so that a sysadmin's lives can be easier, or they want to make it so that the world can get uh, better data science tools. And when you combine kind of that that mission with a company, you can get some really powerful outcomes. And and just from a, a, a personal perspective, it's more fun to work with companies like that than than folks that don't necessarily have a mission. Yeah, I think we've seen this in, in OpenStack too, where um you know, people working at, at big companies that maybe are just kind of kicking the tires, thinking about uh, OpenStack, you know, they come to the summit, they have fun. It's just more fun than like being stuck in a cubicle all day. <laughs> and, and just working with people at your company, you get to meet smart people at other companies, and it can become part of your job to work with people at other companies, and that just seems really obvious to everyone in open source, but that's just not how it works. Most jobs, unless you're in business development or sales, you don't talk to people at other companies. Right. It just is not part of your job. You're, you're mostly talking to people at your company. And once you get a taste of that, it's like, wow, this is actually really cool and we're trying to accomplish something. And like, there's so, so many things written about culture, like companies, the most important thing in a company is culture, which is totally true, but I think, you know, people that read some Harvard business review, you know how I feel about Harvard. Um, <laughs> they're just like, oh, well, we just need to put more culture in it. Let's hire a culture person, you know, and like, just throw more culture. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. You don't just like throw, you know, get a foosball table, now you have culture. It's like people think that's like the solution, but um, you actually want them to be on a mission uh, that has purpose and then they'll be excited to come to work and like we, everybody feels better about that. Yeah, it's, 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 if you think about like to that point, uh, when we, when Rackspace started uh, OpenStack, uh, we didn't, you know, it was hard for us to recruit developers. It was just, uh, you know, we weren't thought of as a place you went to work on interesting problems. And, um, if you're a really good developer, you probably, in addition to wanting to have a job, you want to work on interesting problems. And when OpenStack happened, the level of talent that we were able to recruit to the company uh, changed dramatically. Um, and not just in terms of the quality, but just the volume. We were able to get a lot more folks. Um, and again, always good things come out of that. And uh, this is what's been uh, uh, great about open source is it, it, it does allow that ability to combine community, mission, and ultimately the ability to, to make money as uh, customers, enterprises, et cetera, get more uh, open to that as a concept of technology and, and what they're willing to consume. So we're, we're bullish on it. Um, and um, I, I think that is, as we go further and further into the, into the world of investing, less and less is going to get invested in proprietary software because, again, we started with a world in which enterprises were against it. Um, I think we're headed to a world where uh, uh, enterprises are going to demand it. They're going to want to have an open alternative to the stuff they build. Uh, and most, you know, kind of core proprietary software, I think, will start to disappear. Yeah, we've we've actually seen this happen a couple of years ago. Um, we were talking to some users that were just starting to get get started with OpenStack, and they were putting out RFPs or whatever to different vendors, and they actually put in the in the specs of the of the contract or the requirements document, anything you write for us that's in, that's you know to help improve OpenStack must be upstreamed. Hmm. Like we 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 are not going to support you building a bunch of like proprietary. Uh, forks or add-ons to OpenStack because that's not in our interest. Even if you just build it for us and we, we don't actually want code that no one else is running, which is a really interesting thing. Like the, the, it's kind of counterintuitive. It's like, well, where's my competitive advantage? Well, it, the competitive advantage is moving faster and the way you move faster is by being on a platform that more people are on. And, you know, to your point about recruiting, you know, we had Bloomberg, a guy from Bloomberg gave this great talk a couple of years ago at our summit and we were of course, just wanting to get users to talk, and Bloomberg's a great name, and so we, we talked to him about it, like, yeah, yeah, we really want to give a talk, and we asked him, okay, well, this is awesome, like, what's, like, what's your motivation, you know, giving back to the community, whatever, and they said, you know, number one is we want to recruit, and people love working on open source, you know, they may, you know, they probably heard of Bloomberg, but, you know, if, they're, if you're a hardcore technologist, you may or may not care about like the business news info, you know, industry, but like we want to be known as a company that, that embraces open source, so we're part of OpenStack, and that's going to really help us recruit that talent. So it has really turned around where you see companies wanting to shout about 
about it so that they can recruit. I'd actually, I guess I have a question for you on this. Um, so one of the things I feel like we saw early on that uh, I don't know if it's changing or not is a lot of people uh, didn't necessarily have the right reasons for thinking about open source as a part of their business models. It was a little bit more of a marketing gimmick. Sure. Um, do you feel like people are now, especially in this community, uh, how do they approach it? Like what is the reason when people say, not just OpenStack, but any technologies, why do you think that they see open source as competitive? Is it customer acquisition? Is it? I think it's just, there's just a general, I mean, I don't know, this is kind of cloud specific or open stack specific, but there's just this general um, need to move faster, you know, more developing software is becoming a strategic part of people's business, pretty much every industry. And, you know, IT was just thought of as this cost center that, man, I wish, you know, the CFO was like, why can't we make it cheaper? You know, and this isn't strategic, this is just keeping our Windows machines patched, which is a necessary evil, but it's not creating value, we're just preventing loss, right? And then as more companies, if, you know, if, you look, if you're a bank, you are gonna fail if you don't have a great mobile app. Well, you know, banking used to have nothing to do with mobile apps, you know, right. but suddenly it's strategic to your business and you back that up by cloud and stuff like that. So the need to kind of, uh, the value chain of almost every company moving towards development of software, meant, meant people wanted to be on cloud, and you know, they, uh, what I think people found um, that had some bad experiences early on is if, if they took OpenStack and it was missing a feature, so they built it in house and sort of built their own custom version. Then when the next version of OpenStack came out, it probably had that feature in it, but they had a really hard time sort of upgrading. And then they're like three, four, five versions behind. And they sort of learned this lesson that like, okay, if I build something and keep it to myself, that's against my self interest. Right. It's very counterintuitive, right. <laughs> but like sharing is, is actually better for you um, because a platform that more people are running is gonna be more stable, the bugs are gonna get fixed, you know. Um, you don't wanna be the only one running a platform. Right. That's actually bad news. <laughs> right. And it might, it might get you ahead for like six months, but then when it, you know, pretty soon, you know, time flies and you're way behind. So I think that's part of the open source um, advantage to really thinking about upstream. Like AT&T has talked about how, you know, they're hiring just tons and tons of developers and the ones they have, they're, they're helping kind of uh, trained to think about how to be good upstream open source citizens. And it's not always, you know, the way people are used to working, but they realize that's strategic for them. So I don't know how that, I guess that it applies, you know, outside of cloud as it, well. It applies, but, to, so it's, it's, that's a, I think uh, in this case it's worse, uh, especially with investors, uh, there's a focus on speed, um, and actually with companies, we've seen this too, which is, you know, if we contribute back to upstream, we get slowed down by the community, we have to negotiate what we want, uh, it's viewed as negative, you know, we don't want to get in that kind of a situation. And I do think your investors um, tend to uh, foster that. Uh, they want yeah, to see, I totally agree. <laughs> they want to see speed, but it's never good in the long term. Um, and I think that that's, uh, I think that uh, is, Hopefully the mindset will change to where uh, uh, everyone in the ecosystem understands the more you contribute to upstream, the more stability you get, um, the more supportability you get, and ultimately, you know, you're not gonna get a vendor who's gonna keep your, your one snowflake deployment or feature alive forever. They're gonna eventually wanna retire it. So I think right, that- yeah, and then developers leave. Developers and then leave. who's gonna maintain it, you know? And uh, th there, I just remembered this expression that was going around from Jason Seats back in, back in the day that just seems appropriate, which is, uh, it was some consultant that Rackspace paid millions of dollars to come up with the slogan, but it was really worth it. But now I'm going to give it away for free. It was that, uh, <laughs> so, I believe in open source, um, is slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Yeah. You remember when that was like yeah. the, the trendy saying around the executive, yeah. you know, washroom? Yeah. And, uh, I think I made it on some banners too. What's that? I made it on some banners in the building too. Yeah. And it was like, okay, well, is that like contradictory? And the, the idea is just, you know, try to get more predictable. This is about data center management and stuff like that, but it's just like, if, if you're in a hurry and you do something rash, whatever little short-term advantage you get, you're gonna regret it because right. you're basically just, you know, it's technical debt is, is another, you know, kind of word for it, but, right. you know, it's, it's, it's not really building a long-term sustainable platform for your company. You're just getting this, you know, really short-term win, and it's not, it's not, that's not thinking strategically about open source if, right. you, if you treat it that way. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's, uh, I, I think that, again, I think that world will hopefully change, but it's still, uh, it is still a problem when you come to uh, the motivations on, on customers. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, does anyone have any questions about fundraising or the environment specifically around OpenStack we can answer? I'd be happy to talk through it if you do. If not, we're happy to keep going. You should do your pitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe later. Um, um, I'll do a pitch now. Uh, let's see, slogans as a service? <laughs> That's the only thing I'm good at, so I don't need, but I need some money. Okay, um, no questions. Well, let's see. So you guys have been around at Build Group for how long, a year? We started uh, about 18 months ago. Okay. Oh, I'll give a pitch. I'll give a pitch for everybody yeah, here. Why don't you do your pitch? So, uh, uh, yeah, so everyone in this room, uh, that is, you're getting valuable operating uh, experience. At some point, invest in something that you can help with. Um, the, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, do we have VCs in the room? Tr professional investors? I'm not a professional investor, so I don't count myself. Play one on TV. Okay. Um, so here, here's, there has been one trend in that industry that uh, bothers me, um, I think should bother all of us. Uh, the, the industry started in the 70s really as former uh, business operators, entrepreneurs helping other ones and really built up around that concept. Um, uh, guys that had passion for product, for business, for technology, for people, for what have you, and they want to see great things happen. Um, over the last 15 years, we've gotten more and more pure finance people in, and they always have a role to play, um, obviously, but most of them are not driven by the desire to build great technology or great products or great teams or great companies necessarily. They have different motivations. What school do they typically uh, come from? Now it's Stanford. Oh. Harvard. A lot of, a lot Harvard of folks Business from the school. Coast. You not trust those people. Yeah, don't, don't, I, I have some self-loathing. Um, that's but, healthy. That's healthy. <laughs> but they're they're and they're not necessarily helpful to their their um, the people they work with. And uh, one of the things that I we're, we're trying to change is you know let's get more folks who have expertise in this uh, back involved. Now I did angel investing uh, a lot before I did this, and it's gonna I'm gonna get crushed on all of it because I didn't I didn't really uh, know how to think about investing at seed stage really, um, and it was new a new process for me. So I, I wouldn't encourage people to to get out and invest individually, but I'd find a way to uh, think about how you support uh, companies, um, whether or not it's now or later in your career, because everyone in this room has a lot to offer, especially around things like open source or cloud and how that can apply to business models. And um, what I love to see is um, more and more of us helping us. So if you want to think about AngelList or other things that have gone on uh, in that world and uh, encouraging people to help, if that, could that should go occur. Go to the mic for yeah. the question. Um, so, uh, again, be smart about it. You don't want to lose your money. I'm not encouraging you to go out and invest in... in uh, Should you have a safe harbor statement on this? I'm, I'm not I'm encouraging you to invest in anything, but I'm yeah. encouraging you to spend... I'm encouraging you to spend your time thinking what about how you get... What if I want to get rich quick? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> question. I do not have that recipe. Yeah. Yeah, my question is, uh, do you have any thoughts on the advantages, disadvantages of uh, um, open core versus pure open source? You know, those two models. Yep, yep. Um, man. Uh, Open core is kind of a, uh, I guess maybe let's define what it is first, because uh, I, I think, does everyone in this room have a good idea of what open core? Okay, so I guess the, con the concept, the question would be, um, do you want to be in a position in which you have, uh, I guess I'll give two scenarios, you have a pure open source project, um, the core is always free, and the tooling around is what you make your money on or the services. Uh, or like an enterprise edition. Or an enterprise edition. You sort of hold back things from the open source, is Maybe a negative way to look at it, but that's right. that's essentially how key, people key look at it. Key pieces that are required to operate it, I guess, is the way to think about it, um, as opposed to things that would be tooling or other tools around it. Um, I think that model is pretty frowned upon these days. Um, there are success stories in it financially, but I don't feel like I don't feel like enterprises are really excited about that model. I think ultimately customers are what really drive uh, what people are going to be able to do, and I think uh, too many companies have been burned by the open core model. Um, they are they. I do believe customers ultimately want to make, have to see their vendors make money. I think Mark can speak to this. We worked with a lot of vendors in our day, and um, you have an unhealthy vendor that you have a reliance upon. It's not a good situation. So they understand the need to have vendors make money, but they also don't like to be held hostage by them. Um, so I, I, we saw, you know, I think to this whole point about upstream, I think customers always want to have the ability that if they want to switch vendors or they want to just fire a vendor and do it on their own, they can do it. Um, but if, there's, if, if losing key functionality is a risk for them or losing a license is a risk for them, they don't want to do it. So I think that model is slowly dying. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, it, there's a little bit paradoxical, like a lot of things in open source, but companies um, don't fire their vendor because they can. <laughs> they feel comfortable 
that they don't have to. It's like they always they have that safety, so they're like, okay, well, I'm not locked in, so I don't actually feel the need to constantly shop around. You know, I just come back to this vendor, but I know that I, I bet on this open source thing, but you know, it's not tied directly to this vendor, so it actually kind of eases people's mind about adopting your software because they know that they're not married to you for life, and then, and ironically, they sort of may stick around longer. It's funny, that, so that's actually, I'll give you another example on that, that, to that point, which is, you see the same thing around like contracts. There's always this effort by people to get long-term contracts signed up with big cliff dates. Those actually have higher turnover than uh, when you see people do month to month. And the reason being is you see the month to month, you're not actually introducing some artificial need to go to procurement to get something re-engaged. It's usually not a big commit. You know you could stop it whenever you want. And they tend to just let it run. Um, whereas when you introduce these cliffs, a lot of times what happens is it's a big investment, requires budgeting, requires procurement. They really start to think about whether they want to go with somebody else. And so um, that model's changed a lot too. And, and um, SaaS has helped. SAS has is taken that. off because of that you know, sort of the concept pricing model. So you had a question, sir? Yeah, so one of the things you brought up uh, in regards to like angel uh, support groups. Yeah. Um, as a young entrepreneur myself and uh, as a contributor to the OpenStack project, how does one who is in the uh, CEO, CEO type uh, uh, organization level build relationships with bigger companies, those who have had that experience to get that mentorship, to be able to bridge that gap and be able to identify, um, you know, mistakes or, you know, exposing yourself to more risk early on. For me, that's been the most difficult thing is trying to identify those relationships to get that support and help and guidance. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously, you know, there's former like incubator programs you can do, but there's a lot of like, um, I, I think that most, um, um, most operators, and not even just CEOs, but you know, guys that have director of marketing roles or director of sales roles that are very knowledgeable, you typically get involved in different organizations and want to help out other companies. The nice thing about open source and technology in general is it's a, it tends to be a very sharing community. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uh, different groups to join. I'll give you one that I've been uh, impressed with here in Austin. Are you, by the way, are you familiar with ne Next Gen Angels? Have you met with those guys? What is it called? Next Gen Angels? No, I'm, I'm on the previous generation. <laughs> Old gen angels. Uh, OG angels. <laughs> so uh, it's a group that was started by Steve Case, uh, which was uh, Steve Case, famous from AOL days. Well, and he, in, he was in town this week, wasn't he? Talking somewhere? Might have been. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. You're old school, so you would know AOL is old school. Yeah, I mean, I've still got my AIM account. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it, he started this up, and his mission was to get uh, uh, entrepreneurs that were under 40 in particular that really wanted to mic write micro checks to give them a way to get involved with companies, not just to write, uh, and when I say micro checks, I mean like uh, $500 or $1,000 to companies, but do it in a way that was smart, which is you're not doing it by yourself, you're doing it with a group, and the ask is that you uh, get involved and help those companies. So yeah, I think I think you automatically get like 600 free hours of mentoring, right? That's right. You get a, a lot of... I was of, just joking. Was no, you do. AOL joke. They, Oh, sorry. so he's still doing it that? It comes on a CD, yeah, <laughs> in the mail. It's a really but that dated, is, dated joke. They do ask you to make a commitment to spend time with these companies, and it's not necessarily just the ones you invest in, it's all of them. So if you have, so uh, the whole purpose of it is it's not, I, I think the question I really want to address is a lot of people focus on trying to get always, the, let me get really good CEOs or high level people that are probably pretty busy um, and, and not as helpful. Whereas there's a lot of other organizations that bring together a, a broader range of experience and try to get them to help. And that's one, um, they do, they get together. So I've, I've watched them here in town. They have, I don't know, they have 300 people that get involved here in town at all sorts of different levels of the organization, all different kinds of skills. And then they all get together and write checks it can be upwards of $500,000 for seed funding as well. Um, Galvanize, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Galvanize, they do a lot of stuff to bring uh, entrepreneurs together with operators. I gave them your name that you need to spend more time over there. But I, I do think getting involved in those communities um, is a good way to go. The other one is... Is there anything else you need to tell me? <laughs> yeah, I could be doing a lot of stuff. Um, the other thing is um, that um, yeah, I, you know, Mark and I have both done a lot in our careers is um, just reach out to people that you think are gonna be helpful. Um, you know, again, this is how we, with OpenStack, we reached out to the ZenSource guys and uh, ask them for their help. Um, I can't remember how we originally, we, we didn't know, we knew Gordon pretty well, but you know, we reached out to them and asked for help and told them what we're trying to do and uh, they jumped in with you know, uh, both feet and really helped us. Um, 
and um, there was a lot of different folks along the way on that. So, and I think that just comes from asking them for the help. But there, there's a, the biggest thing I would look for is just building a good network and letting that uh, work itself out. So I think we're Done. just about out of time. Is there any more questions? I think does it is it two thirty? I believe. Uh, let's see. Anything I, else? I need to ask you another question. What's your favorite barbecue place? And don't say Franklin's. Well, I haven't, you believe it or not, I've not actually eaten at Franklin's. All right, get the hell out of here. I like La Barbecue. Oh, La Barbecue? Yeah. I actually haven't eaten there, which is kind of embarrassing. So how about you take me to Franklin's, I'll take you to La Barbecue. Okay, it's a date. Thank you. Thanks.